This episode of the Accounting Insiders Podcast is brought to you in part by Zero. Zero is a powerful cloud accounting software that improves efficiencies across your practice. With all client data stored on a single unified ledger, you and your clients can easily access and collaborate on the same set of books. Zero's advisor tools and automation solutions reduce time-consuming manual tasks and put data entry on autopilot. Work faster and more efficiently than ever before with Zero. Visit zero.com slash Accounting Insiders to learn more. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Accounting Insiders Podcast. My name is Gary Dehart, and I am the host of the Accounting Insiders Podcast and the publisher of Insightful Accountant. And my guest today is John, uh, oh, I'm going to start over. My guest today is John Martinka, and he is the co-founder of, I've worked on this before, but it's Nakomis Advisory Services. Did I get that right? You got it right. You it's got a, it right. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. And um, so, so welcome, John. Um, you and your daughter, correct? Or right. Running My that? daughter's been with, working with me for about six or seven years now, and uh, uh, it's 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 very interesting and fun. And you've been doing this for twenty five years. Is that right? Twenty five years or so. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, so tell us just a little bit about your background and how you like. You know, where'd you come from? How'd you end up doing what you're doing now? And then we'll just dive into our conversation. You know, my background is a lot of small business. I think I only worked six or six months or so for a large corporation in my career. Uh, my, I like to say my first real job out of college was uh, in, I grew up in the Midwest, was working with the, for the local concert promoter and did that for a bunch of years. And then my wife and I had the itch to move and it was one of those small businesses where the owner wasn't that much older than me and I wasn't going to get any further. And we just wanted to explore and we ended up in Seattle and uh, did some things. And and through serendipity, I got into the buy, sell M&A world through a friend uh, in my rotor, my rotary club who said something along the lines of, I've always thought you'd be good in this business. Mm. And it's fun. It's like you meet, a, like you do, I meet a lot of different people different right. companies. Uh, I like variety. Yeah. And so you, you got into it from a, as an independent person or working for a business and then you started your own or. Well, as an like independent. Uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of that in this industry. Uh, so yeah. And it's been good. And I built it. We have my, you know, my daughter's with me. We have one other person that works with us and uh, it's a nice little company. And what is that business? Actually, before I ask that question, clearly your background picture there that is not uh, that is not in the greater Seattle area. At least it wasn't didn't look like that last time I was out there. So um, tell us a little bit about that, because I think you mentioned Rotary. I think uh, that work you do there is certainly worth amplifying and sharing. So could you yeah, share a little the, bit about that? Yeah, the picture is the Caribbean. It's it actually was taken from uh, uh, the hotel we were at. We go to Antigua. Antigua and Barbuda country in the Caribbean. I uh, work with the local, one of the local school districts, a tech program, and we donate computers. I think by the time we get down there in February, 2025, it'll be about 10,000 computers donated to the schools. Wow. And we take students who get hosted. What a great experience in life to be hosted in another country. And they install Wi-Fi networks and get the computers all set up in the, in the primary schools. And it's it's been very uh, rewarding over the years. And and how do you decide what students get to go? That's an interesting uh, process because the teacher uh, in charge of this, who's been a great partner, Jeff uh, Mason is his name. He tracks all their volunteer hours on getting all the equipment ready for the trip. Okay. And they have to earn their way through volunteering. And they work on their own time, not, not school time. And they'll put in, uh, a, let's put it this way. They, the ones who go put in anywhere from 50 to a hundred some hours of their own time. Wow. That's great. That's, that's a great, uh, setting a great example of, uh, of giving back. So, and then how many, how many adults go down there? This year we'll have this next trip. We'll have, I think, eight or nine adults we've had as many as uh uh 15 i think 
uh, they, you know, they're team leaders, they go out and help. And we have a second part of it. My wife sets up a sewing center every time we go there for, uh, ladies who they just love to sew but they don't have the equipment so we donate the equipment and set them up around the island oh that's fantastic okay all right so your business is can are you connecting buyers and sellers is that primarily what you do or what's what's your business primarily it's connecting buyers and sellers and getting the deal done okay so and and, and, and this is relevant conversation to our audience again, which is primarily, you know, public accounting professionals. They might be, they may be, you know, bookkeepers who are working with clients. They may be CPAs working with clients, tax professionals working with clients with the underlying, you know, the, the common denominator is they're working with clients. And so the reason I, I think this is a great conversation for our audience is the accounting professional the public accounting professional sits in a seat of of really being able to influence how a business functions and the longevity and success of a business because they are intimately you know knowledgeable about all aspects or could be and should be knowledgeable about all these aspects of the business and so when you are connecting buyers and helping move this process how much involvement do you have with like a public accounting professional, somebody who's not working inside that company? Quite a bit. Yeah. And every company is different and every situation is different. But if you, if you step back and look at it, someone buying a business or selling one, what's the first thing the buyer and the bank asks for three to five years of financial statements. Mm -hmm. They tell the picture of the company uh, and you want it to tell the true picture of the company. The uh, the more games the owner plays with the with the financials, in other words, uh, you know, blending the personal and the business checkbooks. Uh, yeah, they should CPA should not or any accountant should be saying don't do it. Yeah. Uh, the buyers look for have they been keeping up on their capital expenditures? Uh, what about productivity? Uh, all of that comes into play right up front. It's the first thing asked for before they ask about people or customers or anything else. Okay. And so, and you've written a book recently, Exit with Style, Grace, and More Money. And is that one of your key things you, you point to is, hey, make sure, you know, these financials are spot on. Yeah, in the first few chapters of the book, the first one is about everything non-business. Someone's going to sell their business. Make sure you're ready and goes into some detail of how to figure that out. But then it's, uh, uh, it, it, you know, there are a lot of things besides the numbers, but they all tie to the numbers. So, you know, they think one of the chapters is maybe, you know, maybe it is about the numbers because it always is about the numbers. And the numbers tell about uh, the employees. They tell about the customers. Uh, you know, what do buyers want to see in a business? Well, show us a list of customers by volume to see if we have a concentration issue. Uh, it's all about that. Did, what What's the M&A market like right now? And what are you seeing out there? Is it is it active? Is it tire kicking? Or is money sitting on the sidelines waiting? You have different stratas in the buy-sell world. Uh, we tend to work in the lower middle market, which means above the Main Street businesses and below the uh, what the true investment banks work on. And so it's companies that you know are going to be making up to two or three million dollars a year or so of earnings. Uh, so it's a vibrant market. There's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of money in private equity and private equity. There are different, again, levels of private equity. Some won't touch anything without 5 million of earnings. Others, three, two, uh, you have smaller groups that will go down. Even they're really not private equity funds. They're just pooled money. And then you have a lot of executives that are saying, I am sick of the corporate world and I would like my own business and I've got a million bucks. And I want to buy myself a nice company that has uh, dependable earnings and 
you know, a good team, you know, loyal customers, et cetera. And the market is out there. Um, and we talk about the, you know, when a deal is going to happen, there's due diligence and a, something that's really been driven by the accounting industry is what's called a quality of earnings report. And a quality of earnings is really looking at the business and saying, are the earnings really what we're being told? It's a mini audit it might be another way to, to show it. Uh, are there singular events that could be, you know, are contributing or detracting from earnings that aren't going to be around next year or the year after? And just this, uh, are the numbers what they are? Uh, I can think of uh, one specific deal where, you know, one of the things that came up in looking at when we were looking at the company was they hadn't invested in uh, their their infrastructure, furniture, fixtures, equipment, and vehicles. Buyers look at what's the anticipated capital expenditures. They're going to take that off any EBITDA figure. Mm-hmm they're going to have to spend that money. What are you seeing like uh, now that, you know, since COVID, post COVID, a lot of work at home and seems to be kind of reduction in some of those real estate holdings and and leases and, or, or lapsing of those leases. Is that um, impacting business valuation or, or are you seeing any direct correlation to kind of what the, kind of the work from work from home? In the small business market, not as much okay. because a lot of these companies that, you know, they, their people need to come in. They're making something, they're servicing something. Uh, yeah, no, we just got done with a deal. That was a very good size manufacturer rep firm that has moved almost all uh, virtual. Their okay. sales reps are, are don't have to come in the office too much. Uh, does that mean they have too much office space? Well, we're going to find out uh, in the next couple of years with what the buyers buyers going to want to do. Right. Yeah. Now, do you see, so let's say like somebody's listening to this podcast and like, wow, I've got this client who has been considering selling or considering buying. What does that process look like? Like if a, say we decided, all right, it's time to sell and cycle account it. How do you go about even getting the business? Um, we've talked a little bit about getting it ready, but how do you go about getting it to the market? How does that work? Well, if let's step back and realize that too many owners don't get up and say, you know, I want to sell my business. I want it to sell for maximum value in a few years. And they raise the dimmer switch so it's bright and shiny on the, you know, a bright and shiny looking business. They get up and go, I've had it. Flip the switch. I want to sell. And there are things that can be done that should be done. And they, a lot of them tie to the numbers that make sure the financials, again, are showing a uh, true picture of the business. Uh, make sure that you know the, the, customer, there's, the customer base is good and being priced right, uh, that they're paying the suppliers what they should be paying them and a lot of other things. And then what you know, our job is to learn about the business so we can point some of those things out before going to market. Because whether it's six months, a year, or whatever, if they can do a few things, and again, they all tie to the financial statements because buyers want to see growth in, in mm -hmm. sales and profits. Uh, when we take it to market, we put together a very professional package and you know, we the last thing we want to do is just throw it out there on the internet and say, here it is. We we look for ways that we can market it before everyone else is going to see it. Meaning, uh, there are there are different ways to do that with uh, some sites that are subscription based that targeting certain companies to buy uh, our client, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that typically targeting? Um based on what the company type, what they do, whether they're, you know, services or manufacturing. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And it's what's a complimentary business. Uh, could be someone doing the same thing. We have a deal closing next month. That's a uh, construction company and it's another construction company, about five times their size that is buying it. And they're getting geographic, the buyer's getting geographic 
uh, expansion and people, and they do a lot of the same kind of work, have the same values. So it was a great fit. Okay. So in uh, kind of in, in our previous conversations, we talked about, uh, or prior to recording, seven key factors of increasing a company's value. Can you, and can you kind of just touch on that, on what those key factors might be? And again, thinking of it from the perspective of that public accounting professional, things that they can keep in mind to help their clients, help them be a better advisor to their clients, even if their client's not looking to sell, right? If you, if your financials are in order, you know a lot more about your business and then you know a lot more about what you can and can't do in your business. So what, what are these seven key factors? Let's talk about the one. First of all, let's talk about the ones that apply to your audience. Okay. Uh, and, but if we, again, if we back up, you want to be ready. If someone approaches you uh, a deal, we had that close two months ago it's because the our client was approached by a big player in their industry. And were they looking to sell? Not really thinking of it. Yeah, uh, but they were ready. Mm -hmm. And that, it, you know, you don't want to be not ready when the, when the right buyer comes along. So what are some of the things that get involved with the, uh, the accountants? Uh, number one is we've talked about this a couple of times. The fin fi good financial systems, good financial systems lead to accurate statements. You know, with a, a good chart of accounts that's consistent from year to year. I could tell you all kinds of stories about uh, companies where you know you say, "What is this?" Well, we changed that account from this to that. And I remember one one client I worked with, and uh, over three years, their internal bookkeeper had four different categories for owner compensation. Mm. And it was like, figure out what is this? Uh, so that's the big one. Uh, but what about growth? I mean, the, the numbers tell the story of growth, growth in sales, growth in margins, keeping an eye on the margins. Uh, that, that gross margin always gets looked at. Uh, you know, things with the, with the employees, their, their productivity, you know, any KPIs on on employee productivity, whether it's manufacturing or sales, uh, in service, so, you know, how many service calls can they make? But knowing that stuff and setting up not just the the books, but helping set up a good system of management reports, because the owner's going to look at the books and say, "We're making money, great." What they want to look at is saying, are we going to make as much money in the next year based on what I'm seeing in the KPIs in the management reports? Mm -hmm. uh, I think back to a client many years ago who said, well, uh, I was working with a, a CFO type on this. And the the owner said, well, this, the statements say we're making money, but we never have any cash. Well, it wasn't even I could figure out part of that the accountant CFO type was all over it. Right. They can add value in things like that. Absolutely. Any other, the, the metrics or not metrics, but the key factors. Well, they were uh, they're not all dealing with the numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the other ones are uh, having a good management team. In other words, no owner dependency. Uh Owners often don't delegate well. They don't want to give up control. I mean, even an accountant should be able to notice that and say, "Look, you're you've grown to ten million in sales, but it's you and uh, your brother-in-law is the vice president. You don't have a management team. Your value goes down when you don't have a management team. And when you want to sell, the buyer's probably going to say you're going to have to stay on, right?" You know, whether it's at 10 million or 20 million or whatever, whatever sales. Uh, be, and the other factors are being able to attract and retain good people. Well, the numbers, can, you know, it ties to the numbers. The numbers can show that because you have turnover. I'm on the board of a company. We're always looking at uh, the turnover of employees. You know. And, and when you look at that, 
like turnover of employees, my gut tells me that um, your primary, what's, what are the kind of things that you're primarily looking at? I mean, if you see, wow, we have, we do have high turnover is the concern that, well, if we, we lose a person, we lose their knowledge base, but we also have to spend, we lose the time to retrain another individual. What's the kind of the key training recruitment costs, uh, people filling in for the, for the person who left that, you know, can lead to burnout and inefficiencies. Uh, there's a lot of cost. I'm not an HR person, but there's a lot of costs to turnover, especially the turnover of the people you don't want to lose. Right. Yeah. Got it. The, um, what are you seeing like right now, just conversations or that, uh, is there a particular, um, industry or market that is getting more attention from buyers right now? No, I'm always surprised at what buyers will will be interested in. Uh, the, you know, there's there's just so many niches in small business, and you know, and then you think about it, you see a company, and you say, yeah, I guess someone has to make that. Someone has right. to make those parts that go into this other thing, or someone has to fix it when it's broken. And there's so many niches. Yeah, and uh, you. You see a lot of uh, consolidation, and that's that's natural. And then others will start up again. I've seen, you know, you and I have both seen it. I'm sure with banks, you know, the banks bank starts, they grow to a bit, and then they get gobbled up, and then another one starts, right? Or yeah, or maybe even the guy that got gobbled up goes and starts the next one as soon as it's right non competes over. Actually, my my room, my son's roommate from last year. That's what his dad has done a few times. In banking. In banking, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I actually have a buddy just talking about kind of the random randomness of things. This friend of mine, he has a company where they go in and they'll do like the roadside work. Like if somebody's got to run, like if Georgia Natural Gas has to run a gas line, they'll do all the site prep work to make sure that, you know, Georgia Natural Gas can run their pipe, you know, down the side of the road. Then they do the cleanup work afterwards. But in that kind of when they got into that business, they realized, wow, there's also this huge market for these. I never knew this existed, but for these mats. So when they take this heavy equipment off the road to keep it from destroying the landscape or keep it from destroying the, yeah. the ecosystem even further, they have these big mats that they'll throw down. So the trucks can run back and forth on these mats. And so they're like, somebody's got to sell the mats somebody's got to stock right. the mats and sell the mats so it's kind of never ending of of where the opportunities exist which is so what's so great about small business and and where we live just the opportunities are endless um yeah. is that construction field one that is just constantly uh just, that there's just a lot of activity in from your perspective yes there's a there's there's a uh a big interest in the trades right now, even yeah. with the shortage of workers, and, you know, because our country's gone through a lot of the go to college, go to college, go to college. And now, now we're mm-hmm. short trades people, which is starting to come back. But there's a big interest in the trades and mostly in the subcontractors, not the general contractors. Okay. General, unless you get to be a pretty good size. But you say, you know, I got a company that builds 20, 30, 40 homes a year. Yeah, there's not that big a market. You had a company that puts in uh, the electrical or the plumbing in whatever number of, you know, a lot, you know, few hundred homes a year. There's an interest in right. or servicing existing or doing multifamily. Okay. So if you were, we'll kind of wrap up on this. So if you were um, kind of wrapping up this conversation, right? And there was like some key things to think about as a uh, as an accounting professional working with small businesses, I think kind of the the seven key factors are certainly it, right? Help your clients get their financials in order and ensure that they're in order. And then consistency in the that chart of accounts. Now that's interesting because when you said that, I'm kind of chuckling to myself because I think we're on our third or fourth accountant in about 11 years. And uh, and we're about to redo our chart of accounts because each time they're like, well, why are you doing it that way? Not this way. 
So, uh, so someone might have some questions around hours. Um, and you did mention um, gross margins. That's one of the things I wrote down, but I don't recall exactly what you said around gross margins. Was that keeping an eye on gross margins? Keep an eye on your gross margin and make sure, you know, there, there are industry standards, but not letting it slip and looking at ways to improve it. It is something that is looked at. Uh, that's yeah. efficiency. Yeah. Uh, and if, if we want to, I mean, if you're wrapping up here, I, there are a couple other things I would, I would say, and yeah. that would be to the accountants and especially the CPAs uh, step back. Talk to your client. Look at the business. Be an advisor. Yeah, no, you're not going to advise them on probably on marketing or HR or anything, but look for where they need help that could improve their numbers. And you know, if they're struggling internally, don't be afraid to recommend getting a fractional person. There are fractional, really high quality fractional bookkeepers, controllers, CFOs. Uh, people who, you know, have got plenty of experience and just say, I don't want a full-time job. I want to work, you know, a, a day a week, a day every other week for a bunch of clients and have freedom. Mm -hmm. And they offer a lot of value. And you don't have the legacy costs of hiring someone either. Right. Now, do you have good resources for that? Like if somebody said, hey, I do need to find a, uh, I need to find a, a part-time or an outsourced CFO or, or operations person, where would you point people to? Well, I, in the Seattle area, I have got a few, we have a few that, you know, we know and work with and they expand. I know that one company has also has offices in Portland, Denver, and Phoenix. Uh, but I think that they're available. I mean, there are some affiliate groups that, you know, I don't want to plug anyone in particular or that, yeah that are their quasi franchises, we'll call them, but there's a, there's no shortage of fractional accounting types out there mm -hmm. in, okay. in, in mid to mid major to major cities. Right. Okay. And, and a lot did, of uh, virtually too. Right. Yeah. Virtual, uh, I would, I would think would be key. Now, are you seeing uh, outsourcing people taking this outside of the U S is that very, uh, prevalent in what you're seeing? I, I've only seen it with people who get basic prep work done, not any okay. kind of advisory work. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And then one thing I did want to ask, we talked about it before we started recording and that was kind of the impact of the, on the value of outsourcing, the impact of a, of a company's value. So um, you had mentioned if you, you know, if it's you and your, brother-in-law and you're running the $10 million company, well, bring in that person, find additional resources and outsourcing may be the best, best route to go. Right. It may be, uh, again, it's, you're, you're only paying for what you get, not for a full-time person. Um, mm -hmm. you don't have any other costs like benefits or, you know, unemployment insurance, et cetera, et cetera. But what it really does is it, it shows a seriousness about keeping the financial systems in order. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the more sophisticated the buyer, the greater chance they're going to bring in some pretty powerful people to look at the company. And they're going to, if they don't see the right staffing, they're going to say, we have to budget for this level and we're going to put it in our costs because you should have it. Right. So you might as well have it. Makes sense. And then uh, just in wrapping up, how do people, how do people find you? How do people find uh, your book? Have you just written the one book or was it multiple books? I've I got five like books out. Okay. I thought they were buying and selling. Yeah. This, this is the most recent one. It's available on Amazon. Just put in my name, John Martinka. Um, our website is Nokomis Advisory, N-O-K-O-M-I-S advisory.com. And uh, appreciate being on your show. Absolutely. And you said you have a podcast as well. Isn't that correct? I do. And how do people find that? It for is your, called the, uh, yeah, it's called the getting the deal done podcast. Okay. And it's on all the major platforms. Okay, great. All right. Well, it is today is November the 25th, 2024. 
We are a couple of days away, a few days away from Thanksgiving. So I'll wrap up with uh, a Thanksgiving question. What's on the Thanksgiving table? Uh, well, uh, turkey. Yep. <laughs> Got to have potatoes. Some turkey. <laughs> and then people bring vegetables in that. But because of one of my daughters is other, my other daughter's visiting and she told her kids that we do seafood for Thanksgiving when we really do it for Christmas. We're also having scallops and salmon because her, her little kids love seafood. Oh, very nice. Well, that sounds great. Send me some of the salmon. <laughs> so, all right. Well, John, well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday. I appreciate your time and enjoy the conversation. All right. Me too. All right. Thank you. All, right, all, all the best. Bye.